goes the recording. All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I want to introduce myself before we get into the talk and talk a little bit about our Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talk programming. Um, my name is Michelle Raymond, and I am the Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks Director here at Clark College. Um, I am so excited to host Catherine Vetney today as our final Clark Art Talk of the fall term. Um, we will be continuing our virtual Clark Art Talks into winter term, which I'm really excited about. Um, so keep checking back on our website. Our website's such a great resource, uh, www.archergallery.space. Um, we have all of our art talks recorded on there and um, a ton of information in relation to um, Archer Gallery's exhibitions um, and all the Zoom links and everything are on there. So uh, keep checking back on archergallery.space for updates as we go. Um, and so I wanted to say um, a few things about um, Archer Gallery's um, kind of transition from virtual um, programming that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic, March of 2020, uh, we are installing our first physical exhibition of the setting sun um, this weekend, actually, and it's going to open officially in January. So January 3rd through March 11th is going to be um, our first exhibition in pretty much two years. Um, and you're going to be able to see it in person if you are in um, the Portland, Vancouver area. Um, you do have to set up an appointment with me through, um, you can do it through the website or you can get in touch with me um, through email at mraymond at clark.edu. Um, but otherwise it's gonna be open and you're gonna be able to go in and see actual art in person, yay. Um, so I'm really, really excited about that. And, um, really just happy in general to kind of be tiptoeing back into some sort of uh, new normal um, for Clark College and Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks in general. Um, our Clark Art Talks, like I said, are going to be continuing to be virtual into uh, winter term. Our uh, first uh, art talk is going to be uh, Carrie Orvik is a San Francisco also um, based photographer and artist. I'm really excited to have her in January. And then uh, Julie Alpert is a Seattle and Tulsa, Oklahoma based installation and sculpture artist. Um, and she is scheduled for February. So those should be really fantastic talks. Please come back for those if you can. Um, and then beyond that, I'd like to say some thank yous. Thank you, of course, as always, to um, my fantastic art department for all of your support and uh, funding and um, just being here uh, to kind of support me and um, our students um, as we go along uh, through kind of, again, just tiptoeing through um, all of the different um, kind of uh, curveballs that COVID has been throwing at us. So thank you. Thank you to um, the student government at Clark College as well. Um, thank you to ASCC, to Sarah Gruler, um, and for that funding as well. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, and to our students, thank you to all of my students that are here today. It's so nice to have you in the audience and to have you participating. Um, we do this for you, so I hope you enjoy these talks. They're such a great resource. Um, and in particular, it's really nice, even since COVID, it's kind of been um, kind of a, a silver lining in that we we're able to bring in artists from all over the country to talk to us here at Clark in the Pacific Northwest, artists from San Francisco, artists from New York, artists from LA, um, and other places that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, to host. So um, we're really kind of grateful in that way. All right, so um, with that, I'd like to introduce Catherine Vetney. Um, I've known Catherine for over a decade at this point. We were talking the other day and I can't believe it's been that long, um, but here we are. Um, both of us attended uh, the San Francisco Art Institute and we're both known for tight, meticulous drawing and art making. Through the years, I've kept up with Catherine's work and have watched her art practice move and change and blossom beyond the 2D and into the 3D realm of sculpt sculpture and installation. In 2019, Catherine joined the ranks of some of my favorite artists in San Francisco and being represented by Catherine Clark Gallery. Catherine's work continues to push boundaries, not just with her technical skill and exceptional understanding of materiality, but also in concept. Her work plays with gender and sexuality, consumerism and excess, and often nods to a long lineage of art historical still life and figurative references. What personally draws me in though, as a fellow hyper-realist, is her care she puts into every detail. Pushing craft to new heights through her rigorous practice and perfectly rendered pieces, her work draws me in and doesn't want to let go. 
Catherine has shown her work across the country at Engels Gallery and CB1 in Los Angeles, the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC, and at the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas, to name a few. Her current exhibition, All This Could Be Yours, is up now at Catherine Clark Gallery, where she is represented in San Francisco through December 23rd. Did I get that right? December 23rd. Uh, Catherine holds a BFA from Boston University and an MFA from the San Francisco Art Institute. I am thrilled to host Catherine today as part of our Clark Art Talk Artist Lecture Series. Please help me welcome our distinguished lecturer, Catherine Betney. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, that was really, really um, very, very lovely. And um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here today, each and every one of you. I have lots of um, family and friends and supporters um, of my career on this call and lots of new people. And just thank you all so much for being here. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And I have a little presentation prepared for you today. Oh, and thank you, Michelle, so much for inviting me to do this. I'm really, really thrilled. Okay, so I'll do slideshow. And you should all see a silver crystal sculpture. Yes, thumbs up. You're all good. Great. All right, so quick note. So we're gonna do questions after the presentation. So if you think of a question, just write it down. Um, you'll have a chance to ask it. Um, you can also drop it in the chat. So if you're new to Zoom, there's a chat button on the bottom and um, you can put your question there and uh, Michelle and I will sort of answer those towards the end. Um, so I'm gonna uh, start today by talking to you a little bit about sort of where I come from and then I'm gonna move on to my um, earlier work that I was doing in college when I was an undergrad and sort of show how I got to where I am today. So this is my family. Um, this is my, uh, my nuclear family is in the middle there. That's my dad and my mom and my sister and me. I'm in the pink dress. And I was a child of the 90s. So um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> child of the 90s. So uh, this is my sister um, Sharomi's wedding and my other sister is next to me in the pink dress and the hat. And then I am in the, in the, the smallest one in the pink dress. And the reason I'm showing you this picture and the one before is because um, I feel like the era that I grew up in, um, the sort of aesthetics of that area and the objects I remember um, from my surroundings growing up and sort of the attitudes of this time really influence my work today. Um, I grew up in a town called Newburyport, Massachusetts. It's a really old city, um, you know, one of the oldest cities uh, in the country in terms of, you know, post-colonized America. Um, it's just outside of Boston. Uh, the house I grew up in was from the 1700s. And actually the original structure of the original house um, might actually date back to the late 1600s. So very old place. Um, this is the downtown of Newburyport. Um, there's a lot of cobblestone streets, probably laid by the Puritans themselves. Um, it's, it's very old, it's very quaint. It's a big tourist destination. It's sort of your ultimate New England town, um, if any of you are familiar with the area at all. Um, it's a very wealthy town. Um, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's, I think because of its age, it's a little bit more on the um, conservative side in terms of social norms. Um, you know, there weren't really, when I was growing up, it was also a different time, but there weren't a lot of queer people. Um, there uh, were a lot of pretty, uh, you know, typical heteronormative um, nuclear families um, and not, not a ton of social divergence. There's people really trying to um, sort of, uh, sort of maintain a certain level of um, present themselves in a certain way. There were lots of these big, beautiful houses along the main street where I grew up, um, High Street, and they're called Federals. They're these big Federals. A lot of them are really old. They're huge. There's a lot of little plaques out front you can see that sort of um, show who used to live there, what famous person, um, what old merchants or politician used to live there. 
Um, and it was a, it was a really lovely place to grow up, but, you know, I think a lot of artists, um, grow up feeling kind of like both insiders and outsiders, um, in their communities. And, um, a lot of people in general do maybe most of us, but I, um, I certainly felt that way, uh, growing up in this area. Um, I, like I said, the sort of presentation of most people around me. There was a lot of wealth, sort of a lot of displays of wealth. I remember when I was in high school, um, it was a, a trend for people to carry around like coach bags and have Tiffany's jewelry. And that just really shows the sort of social standing of the people in the town, I think. Um, and, you know, I am now a, a feminist. I'm really interested in feminism, but at the time, you know, I didn't really have the language to describe that. So I saw a lot of these um, sort of heteronormative families around me, a lot of people adhering to sort of um, traditional uh, social structures. And it's part of me, that's part of who I am. Um, I grew up in this area, but I also felt like an outsider because um, as you know, somebody without the vocabulary to talk about a lot of these things, I didn't always resonate with all of them. Fast forward a little bit, I went to um, Boston University to get my undergraduate degree in painting. And this was, I got a, I got a great education there. Really, um, I learned a ton about drawing and painting and I use a lot of those skills today. I re lean very heavily on them. Um, however, at the time, so this was like early 2000s, this was a lot of the painting that um, was being sort of directly and indirectly propped up as really great examples of painting. Um, so a lot of really big, brushy, colorful works drawing from like the abstract expressionist tradition in the mid century. Um, again, I did not yet have the language or vocabulary to talk about feminism, but at the time, there was something here that I just couldn't relate to. And I didn't know what it was. Um, looking back, I now know that behind this way of painting, there's sort of a macho male dominated history and energy. Um, and I, I love a lot of these paintings, but there was something that I just personally couldn't relate to. And I couldn't put my finger on it. I didn't have the words to describe it. Um, I think the way I reacted to that, though, is by making, instead of making paintings that looked like this, I was making things that looked like this. So this is um, three panels. They're eight feet tall by four feet across each. And it's layers and layers of oil paint um, sort of glazed in translucent layers on a canvas. So they're actually, there's a lot of deep, complex color, even though they look very dark. And the spots I flecked out with a razor blade. So I wasn't thinking instead of a sort of additive, um, adding sort of squishy paint to the surface, I was like flucking away with this really sharp, sharp object. And I think this sort of approach, this like repetitive mark making approach was sort of an answer to the sort of big brushy, exuberant macho male energy um, painting that we were really um, talking about a lot. So this is a drawing that I did on a wall. Um, it's quite large. It, um, the central shape there is probably about the size of my, um, my wingspan um, from one arm to the other. And if you walked close up to this wall, you would see this. So it, the whole thing was made from these repetitive little bubbles. Um, and I think that I was finding ways to sort of push against the type of painting that was really being, um, really being promoted a lot in our school as like sort of examples of the best type of painting and sort of what we should all aspire to. So Again, I didn't quite, uh, I, I knew I was rebelling against something that just didn't feel right. And looking back, I think these sort of repetitive marks that sort of build on each other um, to create something monumental, even though each mark itself is, is quite humble and sort of looks like the other marks. That was my sort of, at the time, um, feminist response to this way of painting that was not resonating with me at the time. Here's another example. Um, this is a six foot by six foot drawing. And when you get into the center of the piece, 
you see this, lots of little um, pencil lines all going around each other. And this, um, this piece took six months of, of work and it was, I worked every day for several hours. So it was, these were really quite an undertaking. Um, I, uh, after I made a little bit of this work, I eventually found my way to San Francisco where I went to grad school. And I went to the San Francisco Art Institute and I, I sort of knew that I just, I kind of had to get away from the, um, not get away from, but add to my East Coast education with something totally different from a new area. Um, and that's part of the reason why I came out to San Francisco. And it was interesting because when I, when I got here, um, I was in my mid twenties and I had gotten into grad school and, um, strangely enough, people, you know, even, you know, some of my artist friends from the East coast would say to me, that's cool that you got into grad school, but when are you getting married? <laughs> I had been with my partner for a long time and, um, I certainly understand the question, um, so I had sort of marriage on the mind and I had ideas about um, expectations of, of women on the mind. And this was something that I made uh, in the first couple of weeks that I got here. I had found this little gemstone on the ground that looked like a diamond and I drew it from life on this panel, um, this chalk gesso coated panel. So chalk gesso is a, um, a very old method of prepping a surface to paint and draw on. Um, and I drew this diamond um, using metal point, which is a Renaissance era medium that uses silver or gold to make a mark on a prepared surface. So I basically drew this diamond with a piece of gold. And not only was I thinking about sort of um, marriage, but I was also thinking a lot about class structures. San Francisco is a heartbreakingly expensive place to live. Um, People make jokes about it, but it's, uh, it's really not funny. Um, it's, uh, it's a very tough place to live for a lot of people. So that was sort of, I had a little bit of sticker shock and I sort of saw all these themes of class and social expectations coming together in this little diamond that I found. So I am not the first person to think about still life as a metaphor for, um, for sort of talking about what a culture prioritizes, what a culture values. Um, and many people go back to the golden age of Dutch still life painting um, to think about these themes. So this is a painting from um, the 17th century in Netherlands, in the Netherlands. And you see in this painting, all of these exotic flowers. These would have been incredibly expensive flowers to buy. What they're doing is they're showing off the wealth of the patron um, who commissioned this piece. And particularly one of my favorite parts about this painting is you can, and many of them include tulips. So you can see these variegated um, red and yellow tulips in this painting. Um, tulips, if you've ever, many of you probably have heard of tulip mania. If you haven't, um, tulip mania refers to the first recorded market crash in Western history. And basically what was going on in Holland in the 17th century was people loved these exotic tulips and they were crazy about them, especially, especially wealthy people because they were the ones who could afford them. I think at the height of their popularity, one tulip was like today's equivalent of $40,000, one tulip stem. So the thing is people had never experienced a market crash. And what they saw was that every year these tulips just became more and more valuable. And um, so people were investing in tulips with reckless abandon. And then one year there was a plague, there was a tulip plague and people's investments lost their value. So this, to me, this painting really shows a lot about what this culture valued both materially and socially. And it really says a lot about the objects that were important to people in this time. Um, here's another still life painting. There's no tulips here, but again, you're looking at these, this luxurious glass um, goblet, these delicious looking oysters, these grapes and this velvet cloth. Um, whoever is sitting before this uh, display is not a pauper, right? 
They have um, plenty of means to set up something like this. And um, I just love this painting. I feel like you can almost taste the tartness of the oysters and the lemon. Um, again, they're talking about the, the wealth of the patron and sort of what that person and what the society valued through these objects. And there's actually a fabulous book I love called Still Life with Oysters and Lemon that's about this painting and about also in contemporary life, the objects that we value um, in our world. So Still Life with Oysters and Lemon, I really recommend that book. Clara Peters, one of my favorite Dutch still life artists was known for her depictions of cheese. Um, and you can see why, I mean, those, those cheeses look, I feel like I can taste the salt on them. Um, they look just so delicious. So again, you know, this person sitting before this display, the patron is not a pauper. They have plenty of means to buy all these rich foods and enjoy them on opulent um, serving ware. Not only are these paintings historically about sort of the objects that, um, a, cult, that a culture prioritized um, and saw as valuable, but they're also about um, piety. Um, there's underlying messages in these Dutch still life paintings about how um, you, you should live a good and moral life because um, sort of worldly indulgences like this cheese, like the tulips, like the oysters, you can't take them with you when you die. Um, so that's all of these still lifes are all about, um, they're about uh, what a culture prioritizes, but also um, they're about death. So that's the history of still life that I'm building on. Um, I, back to my work, um, I was thinking more and more about wedding culture after I made that little diamond drawing. And I decided to take it a step further. I looked um, up my own name on online wedding registries that were listed under my name, but belong to strangers. So other Catherine V's out there um, and their partners asking for different things. I came across one that where the, the uh, recipient asked for many, many pieces of Waterford crystal. And I was really fascinated by um, these objects. And there was one in particular and it was a butter dish. And this butter dish was priced at $155. And I could not believe that. I couldn't get this object out of my head. I was in grad school. I was like, this is a fortune. And um, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So I eventually went to Macy's and I bought it. Um, I had a friend come to, with me for support. And then I started drawing it in these still lives. Again, this is um, gold point. So it's drawn with a piece of gold on a chalk gessoed surface. So um, in the center of this butter dish drawing, I sort of scrambled the pattern of the cut crystal and I wanted to um, make it look distorted. I wanted this sort of rigid um, patterning and the rigid sort of social symbolizing that this butter dish represented to me to sort of become scrambled and nonsensical. Um, and kind of turn into a little acid trip in the center. So this, I made the butter dish look like it was sort of melting and devolving and collapsing in on itself. Um, after I drew this sort of melting butter dish, a lot of people were saying to me, well, maybe you should actually melt some crystal. So I thought that was a good idea. So I started melting actual crystal. So these are um, two lead crystal pitchers that I, from, from the 90s, from the era that has informed um, a lot of my thinking and uh, sort of interest in objects. Um, I put them in the kiln and I just flattened them. I just melted them all the way down. And when they come out of the kiln, they're clear, just like crystal that goes in is clear. But I ended up um, mirroring the surface of these using silver nitrate. So I wanted to turn the surface of these objects that for me were so loaded with cultural references on um, sort of what we value as a culture, um, what we value in terms of gender, 
uh, the images that we try to project to others through the objects we buy and surround ourselves with. And I wanted to, I wanted viewers to be able to look into the surface um, of this, um, of this, you know, object laden with all of the symbolism and see themselves reflected back and the room behind them reflected back sort of in a distorted way. Um, I started melting uh, crystal objects into some different shapes. This one's kind of drooping off of a slanted shelf. And I didn't stop drawing though, um, as I was making these sculptures. So this is a, um, another metal point drawing. You can see there's a little bit of tonal shifts in this drawing. The warmer hues are made using silver, which tarnishes. Even when you draw with it, it tarnishes. So it, it takes on a warm color. And the cooler areas are made with a piece of gold. So gold doesn't tarnish. So you can get a little bit of color variation when you're working with metal point. Um, this is a drawing that features really expensive uh, antique lead crystal and in the background and in the foreground is sort of budget friendly mass produced um, department store type counterparts. Um, in the center of this is another Easter egg. Um, I wanted to put one melted cup that you kind of only notice if you look at it for a really, really long time. Um, so I kept making drawings. Um, this one has sort of normally formed crystal looking like it's sort of falling from the sky. And then the foreground of this piece is more melted crystal. All of these cups, I actually put in the kiln and melted too. So I didn't, I could not make this up. Um, I had to actually make the references and use them to draw from. Um, here's another example. Um, while this piece doesn't have any melted crystal, I set them all up on a piece of reflective silver mylar. So it made sort of a wiggly type funhouse mirror for the pieces. And I just, I loved um, in my setup how it looked like the crystal was sort of melting away into like a river of, of melted crystal. Here's a little detail. This is also metal point, but there's a little graphite and um, egg tempera in it as well in the highlights. That's why you see a little to more tonal variation in this piece than the others. Uh, my sculpture started getting a little bit more liquidy so um, and a little more devolved. So I started piling lead crystal on square kiln shelves and then letting it droop off the side when I, while I cranked up the heat of the kiln and watching actual drifts of molten crystal form. Um, and then when I like the way it looks, I'll try to stop the firing as quick as I can so it holds the position. Um, I also started working with a particular type of crystal. So this is Avon um, lead crystal pitchers that um, were produced in the late 80s and early 90s. Again, sort of the era of my childhood. Um, Avon, uh, if you aren't familiar with it, is a multi-level marketing company, um, which uh, if you are new to multi-level marketing companies, there's a documentary called Lulu Rich, which is really, really good. And it talks all about how they work. Um, there's sort of these exploitive business models that sort of promise people this idea of, uh, of a better life through creating your own business, buying another company's products and selling it, which, which makes sense, except the way they're structured, that really doesn't work out for people. Um, and they tend to leave people worse off financially than where they started. And they often prey on women, they often prey on poor women. Um, this piece is called selling the dream. There's a phrase used in business um, where people talk about selling, you're not selling a product, you're selling the dream of a product. And I thought that really related to the promise that these MLMs were selling people. Um, here's another example of uh, sort of more devolved, melty Avon lead crystal, all dripping off of pedestals. Um, this was installed in Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco. And in this piece, I really cranked up the heat of the kiln and I started to make puddles of crystal in the bottom. Um, so these are actually drips of crystal that I would then take off mirror and add it to the installation. 
this piece um, I love, sometimes the etching of the original crystal gets left behind throughout all the firing. So this is an example of some morning glories that were left behind on this um, Avon lead crystal vase that sort of survived through the firing process. Um, lately, I've been experimenting with some other coatings. So instead of just silver, this is lead particles that have attached to the surface. Um, and I, I love the color of the lead. It kind of looks like an oil slick to me. And then I've also been leaving crystal clear a little bit more often. So this is what it looks like when it comes out of the kiln. It's often really beautiful, just the way it is. Um, and this is this piece is installed on a Victorian era mahogany lead crystal. I'm sorry, um, mahogany corner bracket, like a decorative bracket you might find on furniture or table leg or something. Um, in addition to my crystal, more recently, I've also been in incorporating Aramis scarves into my setup. So. Um, this is an Aramis scarf with a sort of this, it was like a commemorative scarf um, marking some church or something in France. I sort of love the religious symbolism of this. It sort of reminded me of um, painting history and how most of, most of painting history um, exists to commemorate uh, religious moments. Um, and these scarves were really interesting to me. People um, started talking about them a lot in the news during the Trump administration because some politicians were um, photographed wearing these Aramis scarves. And it was sort of seen as like a very tone deaf thing to do, wear this sort of really expensive luxury item when so many people were suffering. So that's um, how uh, Aramis scarves got my attention. But I love them as sort of another really layered symbol of um, womanhood and aspirational womanhood in addition to the crystal. And I also see them sort of as like little paintings in themselves. They're often commissioned by artists. They're beautiful objects. Um, they're sort of two dimensional squares like a painting, but then you can scrunch them up and wear them around your neck or around your bag. And I also wanted to add these sort of hands kind of reaching towards these objects, um, sort of wanting to touch them to sort of talk more about that aspiration. Um, I thought it would be interesting if the hands got a little more aggressive and a little more greedy. So I started drawing them kind of poking into the scarves and reaching out to touch the scarves. Um, I uh, was also thinking a little bit about depictions of, um, in art history, depictions of the Doubting Thomas as he sort of poked into Christ's wound to see if Christ actually is who he says he is. And I was thinking to myself of these hands sort of poking into these scarves to see if the scarves are real, if the cultural message, messaging behind them is real, if they really symbolize everything that, you know, I saw in these scarves about womanhood and aspiration and sort of the purchasing and consumption of these luxury goods. Um, this piece, I actually also uh, cut apart in Photoshop, not really, but I took photos of it and I cut chunks out and I distorted them and I changed the colors and then I turned them back into scarves. So I bought scarves, drew from them, painted from them, made this still life um, set up. And then I made scarves out of that. So I decided to print them back onto silk um, to sort of return them to their original um, form as a, as a fashion item. So I showed these in uh, my show in, in 2019 at Catherine Clark Gallery. And the idea was people could walk into the gallery and buy a scarf and walk out with it, just like you would in a scarf store in an Aramis store. Here's a little, um, installation shot of that show and sort of all of the bodies of work living together. There's, um, there's a lead crystal, uh, large installation of plates on the back wall. There's this um, dining room table, table filled with scarves in front of it. And right next to it is um, that big scarf painting that I just showed you. That painting, by the way, is made with um, metal point. The hands are metal point. And the scarves themselves are made with casein, which is a milk-based paint 
it's another, it's very old, it's very ancient. You can see casein paintings from, um, you know, you can see casein cave paintings. So it's another medium with a lot of history. And this is my last slide for you. Um, I have a show right now on view at Catherine Clark Gallery in San Francisco. If you find yourself there, um, as Michelle mentioned, it's up through December 23rd. This is a piece in the show um, called Trophies. Um, it's a uh, lead crystal stoppers, like sort of decanter stoppers on an Hermes scarf. And um, if you'd like to keep in touch, I would love that. My Instagram is, um, it's at K.A. Vetney. Um, my website is on here and I have a mailing list. Um, and it's, I'm not hard to find if you, you can go to my website and put contact and pretty easily send me an email. So um, if you feel moved, I would love to keep in touch. And that is, that's all I have for you today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Catherine. This is amazing. Um, cool. Um, well, thank you. Um, I guess we'll open it up now. If anybody has any questions um, for Catherine, feel free to put it in the chat or um, unmute yourselves and feel free to use your audio and ask questions that way. I kind of was thinking about color, your relationship to color, um, Catherine, because um, the entire time that I've, I've known you and your work, I feel like color has been something that um, almost doesn't exist. And then in your more recent work, it starts to, to creep in a little bit. And so I wonder how you feel about color or the lack of color or anything related to that that you wanna kind of add. That's a great question. Um... I just see my friend uh, on the call, Emily, was also wanting to ask a question about color. We, we talk, we've talked a lot about color. Um, we've known each other for a long time. Um, thank you for that question. Yeah, so that's a good one. I think that it, you know, sort of um, uh, putting color aside for a while when I was an undergrad was part of my like rebellion against the type of painting that was really being propped up as like, this is the best type of painting. This is what your painting should be looking like. Um, and I just found it, I found it overwhelming. I found like it didn't, it didn't make sense to me. And I also, I think it was part of that rebellion. So I haven't used color for a long time. It's probably been a good decade or so, um, if not a little more. And then just recently in the scarf paintings, it sort of all came back to me at once. Um, and all of a sudden I, you know, threw up colors everywhere. Like it wasn't, you know, I didn't start with one or two. Um, I'm really using a lot in these scarves. So I think it's a very personal relationship. Um, but it's always something that's had to feel really right to me. I guess I'm really sensitive to color. Like just, there has to be a reason to have the colors. Otherwise I personally am like, well, why am I adding this? So I think that's how I would describe my relationship to it. Yeah. There's something so, um, rich, you know, you're talking so much about like kind of, um, you know, economic structures and like hierarchies and things like that. And like color just adds, uh, a, an, another layer of richness, right. Where maybe it would actually start to take away in some ways from your work because the detail and just kind of talking about the actual objects as they are versus kind of thinking about them in terms of their color, maybe it would, maybe it would kind of send it over the edge in a way, um, or maybe it would add to it. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I love that. Um, so a few questions in the chat. So I'm just going to read them to you, Catherine, if that's cool. Um, so uh, Joel says, uh, do you have any video clips of the crystal actually melting? That sounds wild to mm -hmm. see. I oh agree. my God. I, I wish I would love to, to have that. Um, so yeah, when the crystal melts, it looks so beautiful. Basically the whole kiln is this beautiful orange glow and I actually look inside. So I'll lift the lid, take a quick peek and I'll close it hopefully before my eyelashes burn off, but <laughs> not always. Um, so you can only look very quickly because it's at such a high temperature and I'll usually stop the firing where I like it. Um, and that's how you get those drips. Um, so I have tried to record it on my phone. Usually my phone is like, absolutely not. I'm overheating and it just stops. Um, I've always thought it would be so wonderful to find some camera that's heat resistant to put it in there, but I have no idea what that material 
would be. So that that's on my list. I would love to find um, something that would work for that. But so far, it's just the temperatures are too hot. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then Joseph says, uh, when you do use color, what's your favorite color to use? Or is it a mix of colors? That's a really interesting question. Um, that's a really interesting question because I've like, you know, really rejected color for so long, or I did, I actually have really strong feelings about it. Um, my friend and Emily and I joke about, I've joked to her like, Oh, I hate color, you know, and I'll make that joke to people, but that's not true. I actually am very sensitive to color. Um, I love, um, those cobalt violets that were in, um, Me too. Which it's, it's, yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like a purpley magenta and even the pigment itself is kind of velvety. Like it has a, a very unique character. It's, it kind of looks like velvet when you paint with it. Um, I love that color. My favorite color is yellow and it has been for a long time. Um, in the world of painting, it's, people say it's really hard to sell a yellow painting um, because that's, that color has, most people do not like yellow. There's like, they have a visceral reaction to it. Um, so, you know, in my future, I'd love to make a yellow painting just as a little, um, another sort of rebellious act against the world of painting. Um, yeah. So those are some of my feelings about color. I love cobalt violet. It's one mm. of my favorite and it's so expensive, like a little oh too, my gosh. like $60. So yeah. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. So, yeah. um, Landon says, do you happen to have a favorite piece of artwork in particular? Maybe they're asking about oh. like, um, I'm not sure if they're asking about your artwork or artwork in the world. That's a good question. Yeah. Landon, would you mind clarifying? Is it my art or someone else's art that you're talking about? Oh, there's okay, other artists. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so I, a favorite piece. Wow. That's a tough one. Um, I will tell you some of my favorite artists, um, Hieronymus Bosch. Wow. Like, whoa. Um, so much color though. I have so much color, but such weird, weird. I mean, I feel like no one has made paintings, um, before that or since that they're really, really unique. Um, very, very unusual, very creepy. Um, I love Bosch. Um, I really love, there's a contemporary artist named Laura Krifka, who I really love. She does very um, careful, uh, realist, um, still life, uh, not still life, but uh, paintings from life or lifelike paintings, real figurative paintings. Um, also with a little bit of like a weird, um, surreal feeling to them. Um, I feel like I am drawn in art to uh, realism where there is sort of a surreal element and yeah as Michelle mentioned earlier like really tight drawing and painting is um you know really something that I feel pretty strongly about too yeah I think it's just like the work you know and like putting in that work myself I just appreciate it on so many levels mm -hmm. yes me too all right um let's see uh Jamie says do you still have the crystal butter dish is it one of the things that got melted? And if you do still have it, where do you keep it? I'm just curious what or where this object is to you in your life at this point. That's a really good question. I do still have it. Um, it was funny. I, when I bought it, I was really careful. I was totally intending to return it. I was like, no way am I going to you know, spend all this money on this thing after I was done. Um, and the return policy was a year long. So I'm like, great, I'm going to make tons of drawings from it and then bring it back to Macy's. But I ended up, um, I have still have it actually. I never returned it. I ended up using it in another sculpture. Um, I put the butter dish inside of its original packaging, really, really beautiful cloth covered Waterford crystal box. And I covered the inside with infinity mirrors and I put a little hole and a light. So if you look inside, you see the butter dish sort of, um, looking like it goes on forever. And that was in my grad show. So that piece might be on my website. I still have it. Um, it, uh, it hasn't left my studio. Um, I'm sort of deciding if I want it to or not. It feels like a very special piece, but that is a, that's a really good question. I do still have the butter dish in my life. I love that question too. It's great. 
Um, and then it looks like uh, Lee says, what about your favorite contemporary artists? We kind of went over that a little bit, but not so not so much in terms of contemporary, I guess. Yeah, um, well, so La Laura Krifka is really, yeah. really one of my, oh my God, I love her so much. Um, there's a really young artist, any, <sighs> if you guys feel this way any any artist I really love I like also get a little mad about I'm like your work is too good and I'm angry um there's another one her name is Sasha Gordon and she's like 27 or something she's very young she makes amazing um paintings of figures sort of in like night landscapes that look like they're having kind of fun but also kind of getting into some trouble um they're very sort of also surreal and a little um fantastical She's um, so hot right now. I yeah, feel like she she's is. like, yeah, blowing up and like all the magazines and newspapers and everything are writing articles about her work and, she, and for good yes. reason. It's so good for good reason. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, I know she's incredibly talented. Um, uh, Danica Lundy. I love Danica Lundy as well. I feel like the, um, the, the things she comes up with are just amazing, um, ideas for paintings. Um, and um, who else? There's a local artist, um, uh, Brett Reichman. <laughs> Michelle, you know him well. Uh, that's pretty much how I think we met in and around Brett's classroom. Um, he I used to TA for Brett. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I did too, actually. No, wait, did I TA for him? Yes, I did. I TA for him too. Um, he, uh, he is local to San Francisco. And I think, I honestly think he's probably one of the best living painters. Um, his paintings are, are incredible. It's, it's hard for me to make work after looking at his because it's just so good. Um, and he's somebody else, he paints with a lot of figures, but he's also does a lot on still life and um, sort of mid-century ceramic objects. Um, so that comes through in his work as well. There is for um, anybody in the Portland area, um, the Portland Art Museum actually owns one of his pieces and it's in their permanent collection. So when they rotate out, um, you know, kind of uh, work, sometimes Brett's piece is in there and I like to go visit it and say, hi, it's nice. No, a little piece of San Francisco that's yeah. carried over. Um, all right, and then let's see, uh, Stephanie says, have you experimented with glazes, clear or with color or other chemicals placed on a surface prior to heating in the kiln in an attempt to see a variety of effects? That's a really good question. Um, I actually have been trying to experiment with color in the crystal um, to mix success, mostly, mostly failures. Um, I have tried to use some like glazes, some tinted lacquers and things like that. It hasn't really worked. But I did, um, a collector actually recently gave me a, a piece of colored crystal and it was this purple vase. And um, I think it's like called Bohemian crystal or something. It's super expensive. There's not a lot of it. It's, it's really hard to find, but um, she gave that to me and I melted it and it retained its color. Um, so this to me opens up sort of a new door of color in my sculptures. I I've, I've found a few um, examples of colored crystal that I'm hoping to melt soon. And so I'm really excited about that. Yeah. I like that. We're all just like, come on color. You can do this Catherine. <laughs> just add some more color in. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. Um, all right. Jaira says, would you say you are drawn towards other artists with similar concepts to yours, or do you like to look at other pieces that aren't as similar to yours? If so, do you take inspiration from other art and form it into your type of style? That's a really good question. I think um, I think my favorite artists tend to be like tight realist painters, um, if I'm being honest, or like weird uh, sculpture. Ron Nagel is another artist I like who's not a painter. Um, he just has very strange looking little um, uh, perfect sort of finished fetishy kind of sculpture. So he's really thinking about a perfect shiny surface. Um, I, um, I do look at lots of artists that don't make work like mine um, too. For example, Etal Adnan, who unfortunately just passed away. Um, this artist, this amazing colorist, I really love. Um, and um, I, you know, a lot of my friends don't make work like mine and I'm also really inspired by their work. Um, so it does run the gamut. Um, I feel like, yeah, my absolute favorite artists usually do make work a lot. Like I do, I feel like I, I want to emulate them. I want to be as good at them. And I, I look to them for inspiration, but 
um, I look at and love a lot of different types of art. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then Emily says, can you talk about your relationship to beauty or how you think about it in your work? It seems like such a simple topic, but I feel like it's a really contentious topic in art and grad school. Like we're not supposed to make beautiful things. I totally agree with this, by the way. It's always like, mm -hmm. come on. Like that was my biggest criticism in grad school was like, this is too beautiful. You need to mess it up somehow. Um, or that they're easy to dismiss. Maybe also the difference between beauty and pretty. Um, this is a great conversation, I think, to start on. Mm, these are such good questions. Um, people always talk about beauty in grad school, I feel. Um, and it's, yeah, the too beautiful thing. That's really interesting. I got a lot of that too. Um, I think I, I still get it sometimes. And, oh gosh, that's a big question. I mean, then there's the whole there's the whole, what, what even is beauty, you know, be something beautiful to one person might not be to another. Um, I think, um, I have fully embraced beauty, what, whatever that means. Um, I think that, you know, I got a lot in grad school about like, yeah, like kind of like Michelle was saying, this is, this is too beautiful. Um, and for the non-art people here, why has that come up? I'm not sure why that's come up really. It's kind of a longer story, but it's something people talk about. I think a few years after grad school, I started to realize that just this is who I am. And if you are not interested in this like meticulous, highly rendered, um, highly crafted way of working, then you're not the target audience for my work. And that's just it. That's sort of how I laid to rest. Um, my feelings on, on beauty. Um, yeah, people do want you to not make beautiful things. They feel like they're easy to dismiss. I don't really know what that's about, but I think I've just made my peace with the fact that my work isn't for everyone. Um, and the difference between beauty and pretty, um, actually Brett had something good that he said about this, Michelle, do you remember it? No, but that sounds like something that I've had many conversations with him about. Yeah. But yeah. I, what, what they used to say about me and my work was that um, it, it looked like it appeared like so perfect and so kind of out of nowhere, the process was totally hidden. And so there was something about the process being hidden that made people be dismissive of it because they, you know, it was just so refined and there was just, it looked like it didn't take any time at all, that it just kind of appeared out of nowhere. And I think that that's like something that I've, kind of contended with too and kind of come to the point where I'm like yeah but like it, you must not have gone through this process yourself you have not created something of this you know kind of caliber or spent this time you know kind of obsessing fetishistically over and over and over again to make this piece perfect you've, you've never done that in your life or you don't you know there, there must be something that's kind of a disconnect with that because for me every time I see it I'm like I can tell and I know, and I've, and I see the process, not because I'm looking at it and I see the process, but because I personally know how many hours I've put in, how, how much I've actually, it starts to almost go out the other side where it starts to turn into the grotesque because your body starts to cramp and your back hurts. And you're, I ended up getting carpal tunnel and like you're, you're, you're contorting yourself, your, your physicality, you're actually contorting it to make these pieces perfect. And for what, you know, for, for what reason, like why, what is the difference between putting 20 hours into a piece versus 200 hours in a piece? Is it really, you know, 10 times as good at the end of it? Probably not, but like in my brain, you know, it, it is, it's, that's what this work needs. And that's totally what Brett, Brett would say. It's like, whatever it takes, whatever it takes for this work to be perfect for you, whatever you think perfect is, give that to the piece. You need, you owe it to the piece. And so I always felt like a slave to my own art in that way. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. I totally relate to that. And actually something you said about the grotesque reminded me of his quote. What he says is that, um, I heard him, he was talking, I was a TA and he was talking to his students and he said, you know, he was trying to push them. Um, and he was saying, you know, a lot of you are making pretty paintings, but I don't want you to make pretty paintings. Um, I want you to make beautiful paintings. Beauty isn't pretty. Beauty has a dark side. That's so right. Yeah. Beauty has a dark side. So I think that, um, you know, if there's a, a dark, an underlying current of something that's maybe a little dark, um, that was how he defined the difference between beauty and pretty. And I, I really, uh, resonate with that. Me too. hundred percent.
for sure. Um, okay, a couple more questions and we'll call it. Um, and then Emily says, just as a comment, it seems um, that's such an interesting point when there's so much labor, but you can't see it relates to ideas of women's work. Absolutely. It's like a lot yeah. of invisible labor, a lot of hidden um, process that goes into it and kind of sweeping it under the rug, you know, and, and not wanting to show um, what it took to get there. Right. Yeah. This, this perfect thing and, and trying to be a perfect person, being a perfect woman, a perfect partner, all these things mm -hmm. um, kind of goes into that as well. Absolutely. Um, OK. And then, yeah, it looks like uh, other folks have to get going and we're at the one o'clock. So, um, yeah. Anybody else have any final like they have to get it out questions? Um, Tammy just asked a question. She wanted oh, to sure. know Brett's last name, Brett Reichman, R-E-I-C-H-M-A-N. Definitely look him up. Yeah, for sure. Um, anybody else? No? All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, this was lovely, lovely conversation at the end. Um, I love these conversations. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so um, please keep checking back on our website, archergallery.space. This uh, talk will be, it is recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to uh, watch it, rewatch it, send it to anybody, you're welcome to. Um, and then um, also please come back in January um, and check out our art talks um, for our winter term. Um, all will be virtual again through Zoom. So uh, wherever you are in the country or the world, you're able to kind of check them out, which is awesome. Um, and then um, if you are in the Portland, Vancouver, area in the Pacific Northwest and you want to stop by Archer Gallery in person, get in touch with me and we can set up a time to um, check out the new exhibition of A Setting Sun, uh, which will be up through March. Okay. Thanks everyone so much Thank for, you. for coming and uh, we look forward to seeing you in uh, 2022. Yes. Thank you everyone so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you again, Catherine. Take care. Yes. All right. Bye everyone. Bye.